We have now a keynote session with two presentations. The first one will be from Rita Oliveira. Uh, it will deal with uh, urban morphology, teaching different approaches. And, uh, well, Vitor Oliveira is an old collaborator with uh, our team and uh, is a senior researcher at the Research Center for Territory, Transports and Environment in uh, the Faculty of Engineering of Porto and uh, Professor Auxiliar, Professor Auxiliar of, of Urban Morphology and Urban Planning at ULP, where he also coordinates the scientific area of urban planning. Is an architect, has a master degree in planning and design of the built environment, and a PhD in planning civil engineering. He is the president of the Portuguese Language Network of Urban Morphology, and a member of the Scientific Council of the International Seminar on Urban Form. He is editor of the Revista de Morfologia Urbana, a member of the editorial board of Urban Morphology and an advisor editor of the Urban Book Series from Springer. In 2016, he has uh, published Urban Morphology, an introduction to the study of the physical form of cities in Springer, a textbook on urban morphology test in course in uh, nine universities in Portugal, Brazil, Spain, and China, currently being translated to Persian language. A new book teaching urban morphology, also from Springer Editor, will be published in the first semester of uh, 2018. So, um, first, I would like to thank uh, Franklin, uh, David, and George must be somewhere around for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, urban morphology uh, and more specifically about um, some dominant approaches in the field of, in, in this field of, of study and about um, different and effective ways of teaching urban morphology. As you know, urban morphology is somewhere in between some other fields, uh, for instance, architecture, geography, uh, planning, history. I think these are the most important. And so this position in the center of these approaches makes it um, quite difficult to uh, establish some boundaries and to define what do we teach in urban morphology in each course. So perhaps we have a situation where in geography um, I teach some things about the study of urban form and for instance in a course in architecture I teach other things that could be similar or not. So uh, in this, against this background there is a need to discuss how to teach urban morphology. More concretely, I will talk about one research project that I, I am involved at the moment, that is called Emerging Perspectives on Urban Morphology. So I guess the obvious question to, uh, to start this presentation is what is urban morphology? This is not um, an easy question but or as it would not be an easy question to ask you what is architecture for instance. Um, some of us and uh, those partners involved in this project um, share this definition. Urban, uh, urban morphology is the study of the physical form of cities, but it's also the study of the agents and of the processes that over time keep changing that urban form. So in our analysis, we tend to somehow frozen cities in a particular year or in a particular period, but and it, that is almost inevitable, but we have to bear in mind that cities are always changing. Uh, Porto today is very different from Porto 
than 10 years ago and is, is different from four to six months ago. So cities are always changing. So I will try to use uh, the city of Porto just to illustrate this uh, definition. Um, morphological studies tend to address the city through its physical form. We can add more layers of analysis, but a real morphological study begins by addressing the physical form of cities. And some of us, uh, within this, this field, which is, it, it's not an homogeneous field, uh, select or tend to select one particular element of urban form. For instance, my colleagues in Space Syntax Laboratory focus on the street system. Uh, once again, they can, in a second moment, in a third moment, add more layers of information, add more data, data but they always start with this, with the map of the public space, the map of the streets. And they produce maps such as this. I'm sure that you have seen some of these, some segment maps or other type of maps prepared, by, prepared with uh, space syntax tools. Uh, they start their analysis on cities with this type of uh, representation. And this is one part of morphological studies. The other part will be focusing on the agents and the processes. So I'm sure that um, most of my colleagues, urban morphologists, will certainly find quite important the work of Manuel Fernandes de Sá, and particularly the plan that he designed 15 years ago to frame the transformation of the city in the near future. So uh, we can say that if all went well, the transformation of Porto, the transformation of the physical form of Porto was bounded by this plan. The limits, the rules of the game were established by this plan. So this is also important for us, not the physical form only, but also these agents and processes. So a second question that uh, is important, and I'm not sure because I, I, I've only been here in the end of the afternoon, yesterday, I'm not sure if the word, if the expression urban morphology was here in these days, but why urban morphology is important? What is its relevance? I would say that the, the importance of urban, morpho urban morphology is based on the fact that the way that we build and organize our cities has an impact on different aspects of our urban life. It's not a matter of aesthetics. It's not a matter of uh, subjective preferences. It can also be that, but it, it's something else. So uh, for instance, the way how we lay down our streets on the ground, and it, this takes time, of course, and the way how we start to erect our buildings as, for instance, a, a, an influence on the amount of energy that we consume in transports and in buildings, including in the later, the functions of heating, heating, the, heating a space, uh, of cooling, or of lightning. And if we, if we be, bear in mind that the three main sectors that are responsible for such an important thing as energy, the consumption of energy, are exactly buildings, transports, and industry, we start to realize the importance of addressing this issue. Especially if we bear in mind the pressing issue of climate change. 
So in a very recently concluded PhD thesis, it was last, last month, uh, one of my students, uh, Mafalda Silva, tried to address this relation between urban form and energy. She has come to, the, to a very valuable pack of conclusions. They have been published even before the public defense of the thesis. They have been published in four different papers. So it's been quite well accepted. And she has discovered that urban form significantly affects energy demand, especially space heating, so here we are talking about buildings, and mobility. She has discovered that in the case of Porto, urban form was able to explain almost 80% of energy consumption. And she discovered another thing. Uh, in this whole pack of urban form attributes, uh, she discovered that some are more important than others. So the most influential would be density, would be granularity, which is something that um, she named. Uh, it's something that um, balances uh, the number of plots per street block and the size of street blocks. And the third would be accessibility, and the fourth would be centrality. So this is a map from her document. And so this is just uh, another set of examples of uh, why urban morphology is important. I've already mentioned climate change, so we can use urban morphology when designing strategies for adaptation or for mitigation. Uh, the topic of public health is also very important. There is uh, vast literature, particularly in the United States, that links um, the influence of some patterns of urban form with uh, physical activity and as such to uh, public health. Of course, being in Porto today, we are always talking about tourism. We are always talking about this conflict was forces of conservation on one hand and transformation on the other. So urban morphology here has also a role in making this debate more informed. And uh, of course that if we think, for instance, of space syntax, um, I'm sure that some or all of you know the work of Laura Vaughan. Uh, about um, social justice and how, how she explains how some forms are uh, influencing in a positive way uh, social cohesion while other forms are promoting segregation, social and spatial segregation. So just a brief, a very brief history of urban form. Um, we can say that um, urban morphology started in the end of the 19th century in the work of some um, geographers, urban geographers in Central Europe. Um, the three first decades corresponds to a certain golden age of urban morphology in Central Europe. But then um, the main concerns of these geographers changed. They changed to urban functions and to overall urban structures. And so urban morphology in the end of the 30s was no more one of the themes that was debated in an intense way. Um, so we had one or two decades where urban morphology was not important, but in the middle of the 20th century, there were again significant inputs to urban morphology, both from geographers and from architects. And um, initially these were 
individual contributions, not linked to each other. Uh, but then, I would say that um, perhaps in the 80s, uh, the scenario was quite different because some of these contributions gave origin to real schools of thought. So uh, we had these theories, concepts and methods that were shared by different persons. Um, in the first moment, persons that were very close to these guys, but in the second moment, uh, they were all over the world and they were uh, not only applying these theories and concepts in a mechanic way, but they were already contributing for their transformation. So now we have a, a scenario that is um, dominated, I would say, by four main approaches. This does not mean that those guys working with the outside these approaches are not doing urban morphology. On the contrary, we can identify many researchers, individual, many research centers, many research work, networks that do not fit in these four approaches and they are doing morphological studies. But if you go to the literature, if you try to make a boring quantitative analysis, you will see that these approaches are the ones that are, have most papers, are cited in most papers. And so this would be the historical geographical approach uh, built around the work of M.R.G. Consen, that was in the former slide. Um, the process typological approach promoted by the Muratorian school, space syntax, and something that um, it is a more heterogeneous group called spatial analysis. Uh, the name is not brilliant because all of us do spatial analysis, but uh, it was a name that uh, my colleague Karl Kropf um, coined in 2009 to uh, frame uh, some different things that were being experimented by many different researchers with this one in the middle, Mike Batty. So is the center of this approach. And this can include things such as cellular automata, agent-based models, and fractals. Um, these have been here in the last editions of th this conference, so probably they are here also in this fourth one. So we have this uh, set of approaches, each one with these theories, concepts, methods, techniques. Um, and um, each one of these and all the others that are not here in this presentation can give us valuable knowledge on cities. Yet, none of these can capture the whole complexity of cities. Uh, I'm sure that if Bill Hillier was here, he would say something else. I'm sure that M.R.G. Consen was here, he would also say something else. But my conviction is that none of this can capture the whole complexity of cities. So there might be the case that in one situation, I can use spatial analysis, and in other situation, I can use space syntax, because it's more logic to that problem that I'm facing. It might also be the case that in a third situation, the most intelligent thing to do is not to use space syntax or spatial analysis, but combine the historical geographical with the process typological. Okay? So, but for me to, to know that, I have to know them all. Okay? So my, uh, one of my research goals, my personal, is to text, test, to experiment the more that I can, so that I know that when I'm facing a particular problem, to know wh what approach is more appropriate. And another thing that we can do is to uh, develop 
comparative studies. So we have generally two types of comparative studies. One would be to select one approach, select one theory, one concept, and then apply it in very different geographical contexts. It could be cities in the same country, it could be cities in different countries, for instance in Europe, or it could be cities around the world. So test your concept in different contexts. So you would be testing its robustness. Okay? Uh, here we have an example um, that was this set of uh, maps uh, were gathered by Michael Conzen and uh, it represents the testing of the fringe belt concept in different countries of Europe. Another way to go would be to uh, select one case study only and then to apply it different approaches so that in the end of the application you would find what each one of these can give you. It's like being, uh, if you have a bad disease, you, you have to go to, you would not trust one doctor only, you would go to different doctors and then in the end you decide which is the best opinion. Here we are not trying to look the best but we are trying to give, to understand what each one of these can give you. So when I've done, uh, the former application was by myself, um, when we have applied it, um, in the end, we were able to understand some relations between these different approaches. So I put historical geographical in the middle. And when we compare the historical geographical with space syntax, we realize that the most important thing that they share is that they have a focus on the ground plan. So a researcher in the historical geographical approach, a researcher in space syntax, just by looking at a map, a bidimensional map with no information on heights or with, uh, of functions, it will tell you a lot of things about that city. Of course that you can say that uh, space syntax will only focus on the street system and at least in their first step it is true while the historical geographical will focus not only in the street system but also in the plot system and in the building system but they share this um, acknowledgement of the importance of the bidimensional reading. On the contrary, if, if we focus on the link between the process typological and the historical geographical, you will see that they, the historical one will add another focus on the building fabric and they will share it with the historical uh, geographical, with the process typological approach. They will also share um, a comprehensive framework that ranges from small to large scale analysis and this large scale can be really large. In the end of his days, Muratori was studying the world. He has a number of drawings for the world, not only for Italy, not only for Europe, but for the world. Um, and finally, but quite important because this is something that space syntax and cellular automata, we'll be here in a minute, don't have is this statement on the importance of history. Okay? You can say that they are more concerned with the future and that is okay and with the, the present, present and future, but these two share this focus on uh, the importance of history. And so we have cellular automata, uh, particularly those models of cellular automata that take on board not only regular cells but also irregular cells. Uh, in the beginning cellular automata would put like a grid and try to make their analysis but now there are some models, there are some researchers that 
can say that um, the cell is not a square. It's something irregular. It can have the scale that we want, so it can be a plot. Okay? And it, this is a, a major change. So these models share with the historical geographical uh, an understanding of the plot as the minimum element of analysis. So finally, to the project. So this uh, emerging perspectives on urban morphology is, um, it's not a, a big project, but I would say that is the most interesting project that I'm working on. Uh, it is founded by the program Erasmus Plus. Um, it is a 28 months project. We have started in November. We had a kickoff meeting in London in December. So now we are in month six. Um, it's an ongoing project in an initial stage, I would say. So I will be mentioning outputs, some early outputs, but most I will be talking about uh, processes and contents. Um, as you might guess from the talk until now, uh, the goal of the project is to combine this approach, to try to combine, to give another contribution for this topic of the combination of approaches, and to do that through innovative education. So who is working on this project? We have uh, five partners. Uh, we are being co coordinated by the University of S Cyprus, um, in particularly by my colleague Nadia Carolombos. Um, their expertise is on innovation in education. So this combination through innovative education uh, this would be uh, their main output. Uh, the second partner is us, the University of Porto, and uh, uh, I was selected to represent this historical geographical approach. Uh, it is my favorite, I have to say, but I, I like to combine uh, different things. Uh, so I would say that my, apart from this knowledge on the historical geographical, I will try to give an input on the combination of approaches. This, the third partner is Sapienza in Rome and is being coordinated by uh, Giuseppe Strappa. Giuseppe Strappa and uh, Giancarlo Cataldi are now the main references worldwide for, for this process typological approach. The fourth partner is TUVN and I would say that these are the black ships of the project because these are the guys that keep reminding us life is not just urban morphology. It's about drinks, about, no, I'm joking. It's about social relations, okay? So their focus is social. Uh, and in all the debates, in all the discussions, they are all bringing a strong social input. Of course, that you can say that um, the company, Space Syntax Limited, also does that, but the notion of space is not quite the same. Um, so Space Syntax is about space, but it's also about urban form, as you know. And uh, Kevin Karimi, it's, it has, today he has a similar role to then. Uh, Giuseppe Strappa is one of the main references for the Space Syntax community. So, in this project, we are planning to offer uh, three main outputs. Uh, I'm going to talk only about the two firsts because this is still very far away in the end of uh, the next year. But um, the other two are, are very near. So, we have to prepare an open learning curriculum. I'm going to show you what that is um, in the end of April. Uh, and the second output would be a set of open access resources 
that we have to somehow conclude in the end of June. So what is this open learning curriculum? Um, for now, is a, a written document that keeps going through the partners uh, by email with a lot of annotations on the side. Um, it has two main parts. Uh, the first one is a traditional literature review. Um, but it has um, a, a particular value because it gathers all these approaches in one single document and it is written each part of the document. It is written by someone who really knows the approach. So it has this value. But in the end, it's a traditional literature review. What I think is more important is the second part, where each partner tries to explain how it did he or she teaches urban morphology. So as this is uh, an open process, uh, I will not show you the work of my colleagues, they might not like it too much because it's still going on back and forth. So I will show you my input to this specific part. And um, as Franklin uh, told you in the beginning of this session, um, I have, um, I've started to teach uh, urban morphology uh, six years ago and uh, when I started, I tried to look for good introductory texts to students. Introductory and relatively open. And I could not find it. Um, this was in 2012. Um, of course that you can say, well, you have an amazing book called The Sociologic of Space. And that is true, but that is amazing for space syntax. You can say, the Anik book by Konzen is a masterpiece. It is for historical geographical approach. If you want to keep your mind a little bit open, they are not, these are not good textbooks. So I prepared my own textbook. I tried to gather for four years, I tried to gather all the things that you have to know about urban morphology before you die, okay? In one book only. And, and this book corresponds mainly to the lessons I give. They have different formats because they can be a course in a, a year, a course in a semester, or a workshop one or two weeks. But the table that you see here and in the next slide are a course of 30 hours with 15 lessons, two hours each lesson. And so, um, this is uh, divided into, um, it, it's, uh, it's intentional, it's not just a matter of it was not, not enough space. So in this first part, um, we try to offer students a direct reading on cities, or if you want, a neutral or almost neutral reading of cities. So we try, try to introduce them to the different elements of urban form, um, for instance, if you are in an architectural school, students will be thinking mainly on buildings. If you try to, um, the first impact of trying to explain the importance of plots would be some strange moments because they don't see plots in the streets. They don't see it uh, in, in their cities. So uh, are they important? Are they not? Then we move to agents and processes of transformation. And as soon as we have these three important things, we start to analyze some cities. We go back 6,000 years ago to the first cities. Then we start to looking at what is a street in Greece? Uh, what is a plot structure in a medieval city such as Dubrovnik, for instance? Uh, what are the common buildings of an Islamic city, okay? Uh, and then, of course, we get to contemporary cities and try to understand what are the main challenges that they are facing and what are the main or the new types of urban form that are 
emerging. So uh, last night we were talking about a really strange phenomenon here in Porto where you have these single family houses from the 19th century that now can be divided in 12, for instance, um, in a plot such as the one where we were uh, last night, uh, five meters wide and the building would be like 16 meters long. So. I can do an amazing exercise of, of putting 12 studios in, in this. So the second part would be uh, quite different. Uh, we would be looking not at cities in a direct way, but we will be looking at cities through the eyes of other researchers. Okay. Um, so here we would start with some classics not only in urban morphology, but also in urban studies. So we, we could be looking at uh, a book by Mike Batty, but also a book by Kevin Lynch, for instance. Um, then we will go through these approaches, the historical geographic, process typological, space syntax, and spatial analysis, not only um, looking at books and papers, but trying to understand how these were applied in real plans, how these were somehow, how these have informed the construction of some buildings, okay? So we will be looking at theory, but also about practice. And finally, and this is linked to the second part of the presentation, when I talk about energy, we will we'll try to understand what is the influence of urban form in some things that are apparently very far from urban morphology. So our second output would be the open access resources. Um, so what is here uh, at stake? Uh, I've showed you, I, I've shown you um, the way how the contents of my lessons, but these contents can be explained in many different ways, as you know. So we can just show PowerPoints such as this, we can recommend a very good paper, we can recommend a very good book. Uh, we cannot do many things because time is always limited. Urban morphology has always a marginal role in our courses, so we have to be very selective. And um, this uh, topic of the EPUM project talks about this or tries to uh, give some thoughts to this debate on the resources, about uh, how, what to use to explain a particular idea. So these are the three or three and a half questions that we have. What resources do we use? What are the gaps? Uh, imagine that you are teaching a lesson tomorrow about fractals. What is the thing that you would like to have to teach fractals that you don't have it today? Uh, and so you will have to, to go for a second option. Uh, and from this, from the resources that you don't have, but you really like to have, we try to discuss um, what resources can we build in the framework of, under the framework of this project. So once again, I will not use my uh, colleagues' inputs. Um, in my case, I like to, I also, of course, I like to use PowerPoints, I like to use books, I like to use papers, but I also like to use, for instance, games, okay? To put the students during two hours, it can be the full lesson, um, playing a game. And this is something that is called the Game of Cities that I've designed it some years ago, which is a, a paper explaining the contents and the rules of this particular game. Another thing that I, I think it, it works very well, and I remember my students' day, and for me to be watching a movie uh, during a lesson, it would be like paradise. Uh, and I think they still feel something similar. So I like to use films. 99% uh, of the films that I use are taken by someone else. But for instance, this one, I've done it myself with Jeremy Whitehand, which is 
one of the main references today that in urban morphology. So this is a one and a one and a half interview on, on Jeremy. Uh, it was recorded in, in Birmingham and it is available on YouTube. And finally, um, I also like to find good websites and use websites that were not designed particular for teaching or in some cases even for urban morphology, but they have uh, real valuable knowledge on urban morphology. If you recall, the th second point of this structure is uh, agents and processes. When we talk about processes, we talk about plans also. And this uh, website is all devoted to one of the most amazing plans that was designed until now, which is the uh, plan for New York, designed in 1811. But for instance, it could be here the website of the World Her Heritage List by UNESCO. It's an amazing place to introduce cities in history to, to students. And finally, um, about activities. So I have two minutes. Um, we have uh, traditional activities like meetings, conferences, and so on. And I think we have um, one particular interesting activity uh, that is divided in two, two workshops that will be taking place. The first here in, in Porto in September, and the second in Nicosia, uh, the capital of Cyprus. So, what are we trying to do in these workshops? Um, we are trying to combine the approaches, but we are doing that with our students. In Porto, we will try to uh, understand the ability of each approach to analysis. We are focusing on the city center, um, and we are trying to, we will be trying to understand what each approach can give us in terms of analysis. When we move to Nicosia uh, in the next year, we will be focusing not only on, the, on analysis, but also on design. We will be selecting a particular part of the capital of Cyprus to uh, design. Uh, during this two weeks workshop, what are we going to do? First, we are getting students from all these five partners. We will be receiving students from London, uh, Vienna, Nicosia, and Rome. And each group of four students uh, will be already familiar with the approach they will be working on here in Porto. For instance, the Rome students would be very moratorian with all this knowledge on routes, basic buildings, specialized buildings. Um, and during a f the first week, each group will work on his approach, trying to get as much as possible at, from the Porto city center. Uh, they will be working in studios in the afternoon. In the morning, we will have daily uh, lectures from teachers on the approaches, from the local authority on their views on the, on the city center, and from people that are working on the city center in a more informal way, uh, non-governmental organizations. Um, so, in the first weekend, uh, we'll get together. Here, of course, we are going to look what each group will be doing, but the first moment of synthesis will be in the weekend. Uh, and here, we are going to understand what each group, what each approach can really uh, get from the city center. And we will prepare the most effective way to move on. We have a roadmap, but this should be changed along the way. And then in the second week, they will get all together. They will work as one single group, including students and teachers. And we will explore the possibility of combining these approaches. Um, in the end of the second week, 
we will have a, a big debate, one day debate to try to understand what is really consistent and can be taken to Cyprus next year and what was just a matter of chance, uh, much more focused on Porto and perhaps not generalized to other cities. And so this would be the program for these uh, two weeks. As I told you, um, this is an ongoing project uh, in an initial stage, so we would be very interested in your comments. You can do it here now. I don't know what are the rules. Or you can send it to, to me if we, don't time, if we don't have time to talk. OK, thank you. Our next uh, presentation will be by uh, Alessandro Scalesius. Uh, the subject will be complexity revival in uh, architecture, building uh, innovation. And uh, I will present to you Alessandro. He's an architect and a researcher. He graduated from the architectural school of the University of Patras in Greece and completed his post studies at the Architecture Association Design Research Lab in London. His practice background includes having been a senior architect at Zadi Architects and the VIM coordinator for different projects in uh, different countries. His research has been presented and published in peer-reviewed reports and international publications like uh, EKD, CAD Futures and CIMA IUD, among others. Alessandro is the head of the AA Athens Visiting School, the AA Summer D Lab, and the AA Greece Visiting School. He also teaches graduate studies at the University College London, I suppose the Rapid School. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Alessandro gives lectures in the UK and abroad while he has been an invited in juries like the Archiprix 2015 in Ankara, Simald, and East Arc. He has previously taught as an associate lecturer at the School of Architecture of Oxford Brookes University and in the School of Architecture of Liverpool University. Thank you, Franklin. Uh, um, welcome, everyone. I'm, I'm happy to see faces early on this day. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the committee, uh, David, Franklin, and uh, George, for inviting me here today. So um, what I'm going to talk about uh, is I'm going to focus on three main aspects, uh, complexity, community, innovation. Um, as it was mentioned, I spend a lot of time in a place that used to be a house that's in London, that's the School of uh, Architectural Association, also known as DAA. And that's where complexity issues started happening in, uh, you know, in my own personal, let's say, interest with architecture. But when I talk about complexity, I refer to the notion of having systems, interpreting solutions, and having that aspect of, um, let's say, emergence or unpredictability as we know it. Um, when it comes to communities, and that also is hand in hand with the, with the, let's say, the community, the people of that school is very much about having ideas, sharing ideas. And one that struck me the most was how uh, there's never uh, one norm, or let's put it this way, you always like to challenge given uh, situations, and it, you know, it brings me back to uh, the French Revolution in the 68s, uh, where what was actually mentioned uh, that you kind of rebel, but you know, your syndicate as a worker is not from the same century. So it's good to be synchronized with what is going on now to understand the world like it works now and, and try to kind of, rather than follow it, to be part of the changes that we want to see in the world. And this is an ideal that I try to put in practice myself. And that's how I'm going to carry on with the presentation, giving you a few examples of what I like to do uh, in our field of architecture. Uh, bear with me as I try to fix something here. Um, I just need to do one thing. It 
should work. Yeah, right. So, in this journey of evolution, also in terms of the, the mindset, uh, my personal work kind of looks like this, which is very unusual for most architects, especially people who start their education. Um, personally, very much intrigued with the application of uh, different systems such as uh, CNC machines or robotic machines and how we can benefit in the field of architecture with those uh, different tools, but also not just as a simple tool, but more of a collaborative aspect. Um, so, well, I think nowadays there is a certain degree of warning by intelligent people such as, I guess, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, or the late uh, Stephen Hawking, warning us about the imminent threat or mayhem and destruction that will come by the uh, overcoming of AI and robots when they take over the world. But um, I, think, I think before that, I think there is a, a certain period of like a friendly approach and what can actually um, AI or um, let's say um, application of robotic systems uh, give us in architecture, how we can benefit from that. Um, it's not a simple task, uh, it's one way to just put it, but uh, for sure I think there is time before we feel threatened as architects in terms of our profession, and it comes down to being creative in that sense. Um, I guess eventually there is some room to kind of apply what we already know uh, in the field of architecture in the new approach of applying the, let's say, new methods for, um, for design and manufacturing. Um, so we need to consider about the design. When we have one system that it's not only in terms of, let's say, using information, so when it comes to AI and having all that access to data, it's not about having that access. It's also about um, being flexible, being um, let's say um, adaptive, having that sort of uh, self-determination, understanding what kind of uh, information you have, to be truly a collaborative uh, side on the work of an architect. So, um, personally I was fascinated with the work of well, at first, maybe you know the work of Kelly, Jason Kelly, with uh, his book in 1994, Out of Control. He talks about swarm intelligence. Um, and I think a lot of his work is influenced by uh, what was once coined as, uh, let's say, swarms from Greg uh, Reynolds in 1985, I think where he managed to decipher the way that um, birds fly. And at the time, the application of such systems was basically used for, for movies. And this was actually applied to, I think, the first Batman movie, where they tried to actually simulate how bats would move in a cave. Um, and he broke down this logic with having three basic rules. Uh, what we see here is those three basic rules is about the behavior of a boy or a bird um, based on separation, alignment, and cohesion. So out of these basic three rules, the output is complex, but at the same time it's very unpredictable. It has that sort of quality of emergence where you don't know exactly how it would look like at the end, but at the same time you have a, a direction. So there is no one leader, but they all kind of follow uh, a certain sort of behavior without having one main um, leading person or Boyd. So um, the work that I would like to kind of focus on today is pretty much about uh, having a take on that aspect of control, applying these ideas that are pretty much um, inspired by processes in nature. So deciphering how nature is uh, sort of a, an active agent for uh, forming different 
designs. So there is a purpose. It's not a copy of nature exactly. And uh, this is pretty much about biomimicry that I'm trying to kind of like introduce here. Um, but it's understanding and then making, uh, having a benefit out of the application of biomimicry in architecture. So it's about creating a system with a purpose. Uh, which brings us to uh, the work of Fryot, I would say, uh, for self-organizing systems. I mean, we very much rely on math. We very much rely on how we can apply mathematics in order to, let's say, decipher and make conclusions and then applications in a sense of creating uh, innovation in a practical aspect. So in this sense, particularly having a, a take on the three, um, three uh, path system that he introduced, the direct, the minimal path system, the minimal detour system. Practically speaking, this was applied in one case study about casting uh, concrete over earth scaffolding. And while this was a method of realizing in a sort of computationally um, environment, it was a self-generated form. When it came to the real world, we discovered a lot of differences. So the cases that I'm going to show you in more detail um, are very much the application of bridging the gap between the digital and the physical world. Um, this particular one was from 2014. It was an investigation which uh, ex explored the earth scaffolding, uh, the concrete casting, and um, using uh, fabric as formwork. And the interesting bit was the more nodes that you have, the weaker the structure was. Now, that wasn't something that we would necessarily know if we didn't have a go and actually try that. So while the theory behind was very much, um, let's say, <coughs> helpful, we needed to take that next step and, and apply that in real, in actual real practical way. So the way we go about it is we kind of create our own tools. Uh, we find very important to kind of create our own computational tools, particularly working with, uh, this is an open source platform, you may know it, it's called Processing. So all the concepts about agent-based systems, voids from Reynolds, uh, the hive mind, and swarm intelligence is being applied in a sense of having to create a certain, at this point, this is just a case study. It's not about the form so much, but it's about the performance. So creating, a, let's say, a, an extrusion, but in different steps. So we have this aspect of feedback at the same time while well, we have uh, our, let's say, generation of form. So there are, let's say, second level forming agents at this point where they get feedback of what is structurally sound. Uh, obviously, the applications are not necessarily about structural performance, but this is just, again, a case study. So we realize where it's weaker and the second set of agents come and then create a supportive Lattice um, at the back. So this is very much a kind of like a, an approach in the digital computation side of things. Um, but we always like to coin it with what has been traditionally already uh, out there. We don't start with a blank sheet. We want to be very much uh, having all the benefits of the existing uh, well research and what is a, as a system, but try to figure out another way, a new way of, of doing it. So when it came to this case study, it was all about the, the, the bending of um, steel rods. So what you see is one of the methods. There are different methods. There are air bending, coining, folding, weeping, rotating. Um, for us, at the time, it was about using a robotic system. So we were trying to see the opportunities of what we can, uh, how we can benefit in, in moving away from a traditional system such as this, but at the same time being very 
rigorous. So we had to come up with uh, another way of computing the spring back. Spring back. <coughs> so I'm sure you know when you start to bend a steel rod, there will always be a spring back that will affect your, um, uh, your output. So uh, when it comes to accumulating this spring back, if you don't compute that already, uh, you will end up having a very different result. And that point, it's not about emergence, it's about being actually uh, real with the, the, the aim of the, the purpose of what you're trying to achieve. So we had to overcome both the tensile stresses and the compressive stresses, first computationally, and then feed that into our system. So I'll show you, I'll show you this, uh, the way it happened. It's a short video about how it all came together. Um, the aspect of community is quite crucial again. We, we need to keep in mind that um, we are part of a group of, of different people, different backgrounds, different aspirations, but at the same time we have a common language. And that common language is design. And at the same time, the design behind this is backed up by our knowledge and use of, of let's say, coding doesn't necessarily have to be something intriguing or terrifying, but math is quite important in our case. Uh, this is the design of the final output. So we were bending the structural support inside the, you know, the reinforcement bars that are very unusual from, uh, let's say, the typical reinforcement of, a, of the concrete. So it, it was more about adapting the steel rods to the design that was actually um, decided out of a series of different uh, outputs. And making use of the different abilities of the robotic arm, many people like to compare it to a human arm, it's not necessarily true. You wouldn't be able to rotate or twist your, your wrist in that sense. But um, we had to customize a lot of things, such as the jig, the picking point of, so all the system has been pretty much customized. So the Fordist notion of mass, let's say, production is kind of challenged here with another notion that I would like to call as mass customization in that way, in this particular case for fabrication. Again, a quite crucial bit is that we all go through the entire process from the design point to the actual final fabrication of the piece. And this sort of uh, experience, we discover new things as well. Um, thanks to the scaffolding, and materiality is important, I'll talk about it in the next few case studies, we discovered like attributes such as the, you know, we don't, we don't have to have any post-production after this construction, because the final looks of this structure was actually looking very pristine and, and polished, as if we had it polished afterwards. But it was due to the scaffolding that was actually using plastic. So, um, I think it's a bit bright. All right, it doesn't really show. Going back to the things that I would like to focus on. So, um, I refer to complexity in terms of, let's say, the approach for design and fabrication. But it all comes down to understanding um, as, the, as being the architect of a new approach, creating systems for your design, there's a certain level of complexity in understanding the patterns and how things work. Uh, when it comes to community, this whole idea started uh, somewhere here and then it has expanded throughout the world. And then in that sense, particularly happy to have uh, a lot of colleagues sharing this notion and actually coming together in different parts of the world, creating this sort of um, case studies, as I call them, through an intense short period of time. Now, I'm going to go through the case studies I'm not talking about, and these ones uh, 
take place, most of them are in Greece. Every time we go to a place and we don't have a particular design in mind, this is all coming together uh, from the people that are involved. So there's a pedagogical aspect behind this, but at the same time there's a, 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 a value to challenge the notions about time, um, challenge the notions about materiality. In this particular case, this is an internal canopy out of fabric. This is kite fabric. The whole idea was to create an interactive one-to-one uh, -one scale of internal canopy. And the structure inside is pretty much derived by the patterns on the surface. So out of a series of different um, testings, the theme that was to put together by people who didn't know each other before came up with the best, let's say, I wouldn't say something like optimal solution, but out of a lot of experimentation, they discovered how they would be able to control the form um, and create some sort of a structural aspect with something such as as weak as fabric. And the interactive bit was made possible by, let's say, learning new things that normally architects wouldn't necessarily go through. So coming together with, let's say, people who are able to deal with electronics. And some of you might already know about the Arduino system. This is an open platform system. Pretty much uh, program your own computer. So this becomes the, the brain and the neural network to kind of control what was the internal canopy, the interior canopy that is actually inflating and deflating depending on what's happening in the, sp in the space. So the, the, the program is kind of collecting data, if you like, with, depending on the activities of the room. And this room is pretty much a, a lecture hall there. Different things happen at different times. Lectures, uh, people giving exams, people just walking in. So there's a, a series of sensors that are allied, um, lying, lying inside the room. And depending on the activities, the whole canopy is changing. Um, now, there are different examples. Uh, they're all based on the same notion of collecting data in different parts of the world. Particularly in Greece, we go in different cities and try to understand the, well, I would like to say morphology, but after the presentation, you might sound uh, not as, it, it's not as deep as you presented it, Victor, but um, due to the other challenge that we face, which is no more than 10 days. So this has been, in every case, uh, a 10-day, let's say, program or a workshop, where people have no idea about the tools that we're going to be using. But at the same time, if they did, we have to go through the process of unlearning. And this is where we challenge the given, let's say, education of maybe perhaps de-skilling architects, preparing them for something that might come in the next few decades, or at least having that sort of approach as an option. So uh, introducing, let's say, the understanding of other tools to become innovative in a sense of adaptivity and having this ability to be not only ready for something that is coming, but drive that change. Um, this is very short. In this particular uh, short in time, this one took place in Thessaloniki. Um, again, we were able to tap into the situation of uh, to the activities of the to the morphology of the city, uh, thanks to the the, the libraries that the, the 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 school has. But at the same time, we were trying to link that to the activities of the School of Architecture. So a series of different sensors at the back, uh, sorry, at the front, is giving signal to different motors at the back. And uh, the, the, the patterning is kind of deformed in, depending on what has been recorded uh, regarding the activities. I didn't mention in the previous case. There was a series of investigation about uh, seismic activities in the previous case study of the Patras one. So the students were able to go and understand what was happening throughout decades 
of a lot of seismic activities. Patras is also a harbor city. So they were also mapping the movement of different ships. So all this became a driver for design in their case. The interesting bit here is we get so much uh, excitement that after we leave, uh, so while we get very much hooked into the whole approach of uh, having a very limited amount of time, dealing with something quite unusual when it comes to education of architecture, and being very practical about it, so while you can generate many different forms using computation in your, let's say, in your computer, how you translate that into an actual build prototype is quite a different story. Um, especially in one-to-one. -one. And what I was particularly happy with is as soon as we, well, because it's a 10-day workshop, and it's quite international where we get a lot of people are coming from different parts of the world, it's not easy to keep them around for a while. So after we left, uh, the students went ahead, they went to the, um, the piece was to be presented and it was showcased in, um, in the Fine Arts Museum of the city. And they went ahead and they kind of like put it together in a sort of a canopy on their own way. And it was quite a surprise and it was a happy surprise that they were able to take that knowledge and then move forward without, you know, without us being there holding their hand, if you like. So the, the, the notion of uh, group intelligence, if you like, is being disseminated in that sort of very active way of a hands-on experience where you get the people to actually do the things that you kind of have... Uh, maybe in mind as, as one example, take that experience themselves and do the same thing in their own way. I think that's very powerful. Um, and obviously working with machines, such as the, you know, the CNC machines, um, maybe now it becomes more common, but still I think it's in its infancy in many schools around the world in terms of architecture. Another case study was in Crete. Hanya, I don't know if you've been there. The city has a lot of history about its morphology, actually. Its urban morphology is quite diverse from the uh, you know, Venetian era, the Ottoman era, um, the modernist era. It's a lot of different sort of uh, characteristics. So again, the challenge was to understand the city by going out and about and getting collecting whatever information we can get, not in terms only about its looks, but with what is going on. So some of the people in the different teams that we have were collecting information using their devices. So they would have different applications, let's say, collecting uh, information on the sound, on the noise, on different times of the day, different parts of the city, getting that data, being you know, able to visualize that data, but then translating that into something tangible, such as a working build prototype. Again, uh, the proposal was put together based on the different arcs. The agenda was kind of based on uh, the ability of taking, let's say, a two-dimensional, you know, flat piece of fabric, converting into a three-dimensional uh, enclosure. And in this case, we were also uh, using that as a vessel for communication. What you see as a cocoon, perhaps, um, it's basically a, quite a, a big, uh, let's say, a big flexible structure. It would take over the, the, the podium here. Um, it doesn't do justice. This is a massive space that it was exhibited in, in, in the city. People will go in, and they, they would be able to understand what is happening uh, in the urban environment due to the projection, projection mapping that we have on this structure. So it was a very interesting also um, learning experience as a social experiment where we would take this prototype when we would travel around and we went to Berlin at the Tech Open Air exhibition. And um, people will go in. There's an opening here at the, at the bottom. And they would be staying there for hours. It was quite awkward when we had to ask couples to come out. 
you know, because it's, um, it, there's a moment where they would find it so serene. While a lot of people were outside, the ones who were inside were just um, able to kind of isolate themselves. And the only boundary was like a very thin uh, piece of fabric. Uh, again, there is a, no, uh, a lot overlapping with the projection mapping and the different sounds that comes with it. Um, but the idea of materiality is not purely based on the attributes of the material, but also on the effect, such as uh, the case in Athens, where we talk about uh, Gestalt theory. We try to introduce that theory in a sort of practical aspect, and also looking at the kind of conditions of the, of, of the city, where it's very sunny. When we go there, it's usually summertime. Not very easy to get people concentrated. However, we make use of, let's say, the different, in this case, uh, kind of kinetic canopy in a series of different uh, triangles, as you may see, aligned in a way that is pretty much looking at the, the sunlight. And through the deflection of the sunlight, there are different patterns created on, on the other side of the wall in the school. Um, and in that case, it's pretty much about the, the effects of the trajectory of the sun in combination with the people who are moving. This is above the entrance of the school. So the people who are moving underneath activate the movement of, of this kinetic canopy. Similarly, the case of using fabric to stand on its own. This is felt. Manipulating its attributes by uh, combining with uh, different adhesives, we were able to create a certain gradual effect in terms of its structural ability and maintain certain bits that we wanted to be flexible and apply that as part of our kinetic style uh, approach on our prototypes. Now, I would like to remind that this is, again, a combination between what we have as a physical experiment and a digital experiment. These two come together. I think there is a lot to be gained by understanding the limitations of one with the limitations of the other. It would be unreal to suggest that we can simulate the real world in its entirety. I think that will never happen. I believe that that would be silly to even try to do that. Rather than trying to simulate the world as it is, we can try to take the basic attributes and then by just approximating the just by having uh, the physical side, we make our comparisons, and we are able to then scale up. So through a series of experimentations and years, uh, we, are, we are able to scale up. So you see what was happening in 2000. Uh, this is 2013. The one before was 2012. And suddenly, we start to look at partitioning systems. But we don't see them as like a, a, a thin piece of wall. We see them as a, a system that has spatial qualities at the same time. <clears throat> and um, there's a certain quality about having your environment being active. Rather than having this sort of uh, uh, inert, sort of like very inactive built environment, I think we are able to move towards a more sort of uh, active conversation with the space that we inhabit. And th these are a few attempts. So again, we have to go through the process of either introducing uh, young students to new things that are away from your typical architectural, let's say, studies or de-skill them and try to make them see how there's a new way of being the, you know, the architect of nowadays is not so far away from the Renaissance architect, however. We were looking at having 
system for experiencing a pathway. And in that sense, different teams came together to make different proposals. Um, and it's about creating a scenario, creating a story. What happens when you cross that path? And how do you affect or get affected by the build environment itself? And these are the different scenarios. We break down the system on how we can simulate movement in that sense. Um, we break it down into a very particular set of panels for this. We allocate the nervous system, where our eyes, our muscles, where the brain is. And then we come together and we become one team. Um, Again, this took 10 days to complete. From the time that we introduce people to these ideas, we teach them the skills, and we conclude with this, uh, with this prototype. This is created out of wood and um, elastic strands of, uh, I forget the word now, it's the same thing you use in your underwear. However, here, the materiality of that is kind of enabling us to have these sort of obstacles opening up when you enter. So as soon as you come close to it, it opens up by twisting. And then you're able to go in. But then slowly it comes down on you. So you're trapped. You're not able, if you were too slow, you're trapped inside until another guy comes along. And now there's a conversation between you and the other guy. And it opens up again. So there's an indirect sort of discussion, a dialogue, if you like, between you and the build environment and other people in the build environment. Um, I think it, it froze. Anyway. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going too slow or too fast, but I, I'm coming to, to an end. Um, these are ongoing investigations. Uh, while they might seem um, they could be seen as games. I really enjoyed uh, the notion of having a playfulness behind it because it's very much uh, intriguing and inviting people to engage with this. Um, and again, it's uh, a medium of conversation from people of different continents and different backgrounds. Uh, at the same time, uh, maybe revisiting certain uh, notions that we know we take for given, such as wood veneer. We basically see wood veneer as uh, the application on top of an existing surface. And in this case, we revisit that and we need, we need to see whether we can use it as an actual structure itself. So again, by twisting and bending, we are now able to make it stand and create a, a different sort of partitioning system. While at the same time, having that flexibility on the material itself, we are also able to create that kinetic side. So we pretty much are challenging ourselves also in terms of having a singular material uh, application that goes back all the way to the casting of concrete where the whole thing was put together in one go, one cast, quite challenging. Fast setting concrete, very, very difficult if you're not making a pavement on the road. And at the same time, using only veneer to make something stand higher than two meters and at the same time twist and bend and stay at the, uh, in its place. It can get very messy sometimes. There's a lot of, uh, you know, circuits and stuff. But these ideas are not necessarily new, if you ask me. Uh, but I would like to kind of maybe uh, Restate that we need to understand how technology can help us, if you like. How we need to also understand how it affects the tools that we use. We cannot uh, be ignorant, even if we don't necessarily agree in certain methods. I think it's it's more beneficial to kind of uh, investigate these methods uh, and then realize that there is a, a constant change. <coughs> In the same notion that cities change, uh, Porto, like you said, Victor, today is different 
from six months ago or ten years ago, uh, our tools change. And they can also change the way we approach things. So when it comes to kind of breaking down this notion of the hand of the architect um, assigning a solution, and then everyone else is trying to make that solution work, we can see how a conversation can happen among different architects, but at the same time, policymakers, clients, everyone, municipalities, and then introduce that as sort of like variables in an intelligent system that can produce solutions. And then out of that, we can um, make a, an option. But these are things that the architect shouldn't be afraid of, like losing anything in terms of his or her value as a profession, uh, as a professional. But it's about coming together with other people, such as, I'm sure everyone knows, uh, the pavilion, Philips Pavilion, where Le Corbusier was working hand in hand with Xenakis, mathematician, brilliant musician. And the whole thing has to deal with performance. And I think performance is a powerful thing when you come to creating uh, a space such as uh, an auditorium, very particular topologies. It doesn't mean that we have to copy that typology all throughout the world. We can be very much customizing our uh, different buildings, still behave in a way of uh, a hospital and airport, but provide a certain identity. And that can happen by bridging the gap between people of different profession. Um, architects use geometry for that reason. They use geometry as a way of communication. They, they define the special form of a building. Um, and we, we see that from the sixth century, from Pythagoras, uh, to create forms considered harmonious and performative. But now we keep progressing. And I think we need to understand, again, the new toys, if you like, that we have in our, in our, in our uh, arsenal. And when it comes down to computation, AI, digital fabrication, I think um, new ideas work best if new methods for design uh, are applied. So uh, perhaps, again, coming back to my statement about the Fordist notion of mass production, is coming to a point where it meets mass customization. And I'm sure everyone knows uh, the power that uh, homemade 3D printers uh, can bring to a person, even if they're not necessarily a designer or an architect. They get that freedom. And we need to recognize that, and we need to kind of take hold of that uh, and see in a different light what the architect can be and actually be perhaps working hand in hand with these tools and not become the biological boot for these tools, right? So I think there are um, revolutionary, let's say, ideas that can happen when we, uh, we wouldn't be able to do it either on our own as people, as human, or we couldn't be just assigning it to a computer or a robot or AI, if you like. But together, I think there is something that we can overcome. And that's where I find innovation. And that's how I see community playing a big role and um, dealing with aspects of complexity. Uh, and in the same sense, I hope this can be inspiring enough to see how we can uh, create the future rather than wait for it to come. And um, I guess when it comes to applying new methods. There's at least one constant. If there was a universal language, I would say that would be math. And uh, applying math in architecture is one way to, to connect worldwide. Um, and that can happen in wall forms and all scales from furniture to urban design. I'm not sure if I went too fast. I'm not sure if I went too slow. <laughs> I just started talking. Um, I think I might have a few seconds but I will keep it there and obrigado. Thank you. When one major uh, issue here addressed by these two, I would say, remarkable presentations is the 
the, the school factor. Yeah. Uh, I think it is a, a, a very, uh, a very uh, real problem. We have how to introduce those uh, methodologies and technologies in uh, our uh, our schools, uh, and uh, I think it would be a very good uh, uh, topic for debate. <coughs> we have. Uh, uh, already some two or three presentations in other sessions dealing with this problem, but uh, I think uh, this is a, a, a will would be a very good uh, uh, a very good uh, uh, moment to do that. Uh, but uh, of course you are free to ask whatever you you want. Please. Maybe I, I can make a comment. Um, I don't want to say where exactly this happened, but there was a moment one of the schools in the UK had to be uh, had to advance its curriculum, and um, because what happened was um, Riva went there to validate what was happening, the, they were showcasing a very big piece, a long painting of a of a of a, of a castle. Immediately they said, "Look, guys, you have to." bring up your game, you have to introduce uh, the new tooling that is out there already. And they were not talking necessarily about, let's say, BIM, which is exciting, fun stuff right now. They were talking about basic CAD. And, and to think that there are schools that are actually a bit, let's say, reactive to this uh, approach, I, I, it, it's astonishing for me. I think it's, um, it, it's interesting how there's a lot of, let's say, resistance in having you know, an open mind to, to, to the evolution of how we, we work. We might be doing the same thing or you know, similar things, but we might be depriving ourselves from saying we only do computers after the second year or something like this. So when it came to having these uh, case studies, we were open to get PhD students, people from having practices themselves, and first years. And you can imagine the sort of conversations that were taking place. It was at times uh, good and funny, and sometimes uh, harder. Because when you, you know, when you have an office, you're very much fixed on the way you do work. But then you don't have an office and you start architecture, you have all ideas are open. And um, the ones who were smarter, they were able to take that freshness, if you like, and come up with ideas of whether it's about representation of information or whether about this uh, application in terms of building something. So I'm not sure how things are uh, in, in, in Portugal, but uh, there's, a, there's a chance that we can, you know, people are talking about beam level th three, four, five. There's a, a law that has passed in 2015 in the UK. All public buildings have to be following level two beam. Singapore has already done it, like, I don't know how many years ago. But some people see this as like a big brother to the industry, where the client is actually following what you have done as, uh, as the architect. So, and there's, you know, there's still some, some, some thoughts. But what was happening also is that there's no room for corruption there. There's no, you know, middleman in the process. You don't have to go to a place to submit your proposal. This is very practical, of course, but it can have applications to many different things and scales, especially when it comes to urban morphologies, I think. Communications of ideas, definitely. And then maybe even applying things, such as uh, now we are able to understand our behavior as humans. And maybe we get proposals of uh, a new school because there are more people giving birth to babies. Stop talking. <laughs> um, but yeah, but then I, I mean, that, that would be a very direct conversation between uh, people in the community. I'm saying something wrong. <laughs> it's a sign. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Some people are not happy. <laughs> but yeah, I see that as, as an opportunity. I'm not sure if everyone feels. 
how people feel about these ideas. I don't know um, how uh, it sounds. not exactly following um, um, what's going on in developing new technologies, but when you are dealing with architectural education, um, it's much more than that. Um, mainly because we are dealing with a kind of field that is crisscrossed by absolutely everything that you may imagine. So dealing with architectural education, you have to be really open to absolutely everything because city it's exactly uh, the places where everything um, crisscross you you know everywhere and, and, and every uh, at very, every moment so yes um, I think that you have to have a picture of a castle at the same time you have a robot going on everywhere because that's the kind of environment that makes that will make the university, well, the, the in general, the the, um, the education of the architect and the uh, urban planner uh, uh, more efficient. Uh, in other words, it's not that there's no evil or angels around here, but we need to have everybody working together to produce something that is really uh, worth doing. I think that's the the main thing. And combining them will make us not exactly more efficient, but in kind of um, not so sympathetic years that will come, uh, will perhaps make us stronger in dealing with all the conflicts that we'll be facing very soon. Not so dramatic as I said now, please. <laughs> It's not um, in the same line that he has begun and then uh, has taken. Uh, in, in the beginning of, of the presentation, you said um, you had this idea that you were learning with nature. Uh, this was very present in the beginning, but not as present in the end. I don't know if it was. Mm -hmm. uh, casual or, or not, but um, and I don't even know if that is a, a, a central question in your research. But uh, I think that that topic of the relation with nature it, 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 it's a very important topic in, in architecture and in urbanism, and um, I think that it, it's not an, an easy link, and uh, sometimes we approach it in, diff in, in, in strange ways. Uh, for instance, when you, uh, there is a, a text by Christopher Alexander when he tells us that, uh, I, I can't remember the text, uh, it tells us that um, when talking about ancient Rome, ancient Rome is amazing, the buildings are amazing, the spaces are amazing, uh, not because the buildings are old, but because it took centuries to be to obtain that shape, that relation between uh, built space and open space, and we feel very good in there because it's the, tra the transformation over time. It it really is adjusted to our needs, and w when we are there, uh, that space doesn't look very natural and it works well. Uh, but perhaps it has some things from nature that are not visible. Uh, for instance, here in Porto, one of the most interesting parts of Porto is something that was built between the middle of the 18th century until the beginning of the 20th century. Um, what is the relation with nature? It is the street work the street network is very adapted to the topography. When you see it as, as a plan, it looks very bad. Uh, you don't feel like when you see Manhattan or uh, 
downtown Lisbon. But that thing is really suited to topography. So it is taking nature through the system of streets. But when you look at buildings, uh, the typical building of that period is something like the one where, where we have been yesterday drinking. So it's a regular, it has no curves. Um, it, the building doesn't look linked to nature. It just is adapted to our needs. So my comment, question would be like, um, sometimes we are taking nature into consideration without that being very visible. And other times, um, I saw buildings that um, take the shapes, the shapes that you are testing, and I, I agree with you, it's very good to test everything, and to, I am a much better researcher if I know your research, uh, and even if we are in separate worlds, I can take always something from, from your research. But when I look at buildings that are made with that degree of experimentation, and when I see in some cities the sum of buildings that are apparently based on nature, but um, the, the group is so different and they fit um, so, they, they don't fit sometimes. Um, I tend to ask if uh, they are taking the better link with nature or if sometimes other people that are not so explicitly linking their buildings with nature are doing a better job. Um, I don't know if it was clear. Yeah, yes, yes. I, uh, I mean, I, <coughs> yeah, I would have to agree. When you get to test things also in time, such as how a city, uh, uh, the urban fabric works, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, places like Rome that has thousands of years of, of, of like being inhabited, will be uh, uh, a case where it operates very efficiently in terms of well, you know, the morphology. Uh, it's funny when these attributes. Uh, because there are different ways you can see nature coming into the game of the architect, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a, an inspirational point of view, and I'm not talking about that in the one piece like this, um, but more understanding the processes, but also the difference of when it comes to form making, or form, form finding, if you like, uh, not form making. Um, so there are two aspects I see here. One is not understanding nature as the actual environment around you, and you go into a city such as Athens. Athens also is an ancient city inhabited, I don't know, 3,000 years at least. It's a concrete, it's a carpet of concrete now, and they have uh, covered uh, most of the rivers. So what happens when there is a lot of rain? There is a lot of flooding. That's again because they wouldn't necessarily consider that in their, their, their new urban design. Um, but what we have now is a difference, and that's the second bit, uh, in terms of like nature and coming up with proposals that are also inspired by it, is the feedback we can get, and we can take time, squeeze it in a few seconds or minutes, and simulate things. And that's what we can do to kind of predict, in a sense, whether, and then we get all the sort of computation systems about sunlight, thermal conditions, uh, uh, wind analysis. And now we are able to kind of like uh, do this sort of uh, feedback loop about our proposals in terms of uh, design and architecture. That's one thing. And the other thing is, again, taking time, squeezing it into a few minutes, about the, the formation of, let's say, fractals or L systems. Um, we can simulate a variation of an L system Lindenmeyer's, uh, you know, bifurcation of studies for trees. So he was able to decipher and put together a mathematical equation about how you actually see trees being formed by nature, and by saying, okay, there are certain degrees that you can 
what they do. We can simulate that and create our own versions of trees. If you like, we can mutate certain natural uh, existing forms. And we can test that in the safety of a computer before we actually invest in time and try to do it uh, uh, without even knowing where we're going. So it's true, certain things are not obvious when it comes to being uh, at least inspired by, by, by natural processes, but it's definitely something to take into account. Mm -hmm. uh, not only to be respectful in that sense, uh, but uh, to acknowledge that there is a power behind it, mm -hmm. to, to, to apply it in, again, all scales. Yes, it, yes, like you said, could be research that uh, you're involved in that maybe I'm not, but we might overlap mm -hmm. because we might get to that point of communication. Um, so biomimicry is definitely a, a focus that I am I'm intrigued by and I do and I apply for sure. Yes. It's okay. It's <coughs> I think there is something that underlies both um, investigations, which is related to uh, um, a very fundamental um, force or energy, which is movement. Movement within cities, how we organize a space. You just talked about that, you know, the topography that um, is taken just to make life of the triperos easier. Instead of going up and down, taking you know the best curve to move within the city, um, and the the very basics of the research, the computer simulating research, was basically in, into movement, swarms, water going across uh, stones, and people moving around, and uh, uh, the structure moving it to allow you to pass through, etc. So that's one of the things that. I believe that you know going over beyond any kind of uh, um, research basic or theoretical fundament that you take, movement is within our field of study. So analyzing how people move within city, or oh, how can we make structures that will help us or make us be aware of something that is going around us. So it's movement, and, and movement is energy in these terms. So it's something that it's quite inter interesting to observe in both uh, uh, um, uh, approaches and is exactly one of the key aspects when we, we develop some kind of investigation in terms of in our fields. Just pinpoint that. So he has just built us a bridge. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's up to us to, <laughs> Let's do to something. walk it. <laughs> But I also want to respond to the, the comment about, um, yeah, it's definitely good to get the previous comment. Uh, both what has been already achieved in our field, so get that painting of the castle, and uh, get also what's happening now. And that, that can actually make more bridges mm -hmm. in, in different fields. Uh, it's much better than just say, oh, I don't understand it, and I'm a bit afraid, but never say that, but yeah, uh, I don't want to see it. And I've seen this happening uh, 20 years now in schools. And there are pioneers in the things that uh, we are doing in different fields. And it feels like architecture sometimes is sort of trying to follow up when, when it should be the driver. When the term architect used to mean, you know, that sort of notion of the Renaissance architect. The understanding of many things at the same time. You don't have to be focused on one thing, but you have the overall view, and then you can actually perhaps give some guidance to the actual expert to do the masonry or to do the carpeting or to do some. I'm, 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 I'm dumbing it down, but again, it's the notion of having a, a larger umbrella over your kind of uh, professional attributes. We have the specializations. But uh, if we, we can also keep that sort of uh, openness, then there's more future to what we do. Bridging theory and practice at the same time, I think it's crucial. 
Um, things that we do here, a lot of practices wouldn't even necessarily consider. However, there's a change again, where it's a, uh, they want to pedestrianize London. They want to take Oxford Street, and I'm sure most of you have been to London, I think it's a place that most people go. Oxford Street is now becoming towards the way to become pedestrian, uh, pedestrian walker. It's one of the major routes that travel across the city. So they are having studies about and using space syntax and everything on how that will affect, impact the whole city. And you can get inspired by nature and the flow of people in the movement, make uh, proposals. Uh, but definitely just by going with your, you know, castle drawing won't make it, you know, we won't, <laughs> won't help. <laughs> Uh, one thing I liked very much in uh, your presentation was the, well, you discussed here the survey. Uh, we have now many instruments to create shapes. Uh, well, very tricky shapes. <laughs> and, uh, and I asked twice, why? <laughs> Why do we need those things? And uh, I think, uh, why? Because many of them seem to be meaningful for the architecture. Uh, they are new shapes, very innovative, but why? They, they are not needed. It was my question. Of course, uh, I don't think it was a provocative uh, question because uh, I had a good answer yesterday and I, I, I want good answers <laughs> to, to this question. Uh, and uh, you, you were, uh, uh, I'm not interested in, uh, in why. <laughs> it, it was said, and it's a, a good position. Well, uh, uh, maybe I explain a little more. Um, there are some people that are developing languages, and we need languages, even if that has no meaning for the, for the moment. For example, mathematicians, it's the, the thing they do. They invent language. If they have use or not, it's not with them. They are only, only preoccupied, the, the, the worried to create language. For example, Lobachevsky invented non-Euclidean non uh, geometry. He didn't know what that means, uh, what the mean of that. Uh, that doesn't matter for it. Uh, well, some years later, it was used by Einstein, you, you know that. <clears throat> uh, that means that there are some guys that uh, must uh, dedicate to develop language. For example, Rudy uh, yesterday presented uh, something that was uh, a pure development of, uh, uh, of language and uh, shape grammars. It, it is needed that some guy uh, uh, develop this, uh, that thing. Well, but uh, that must be reduced to some guys, not everyone, because if everyone uh, wants to create his own language, well, the, the concept of language disappears because <laughs> language is something that we, ask, we all knew, used to communicate. If anyone has his own language, language disappears. <laughs> it, it's not possible. Um, so what college is... Uh, bring, bring to us in the, that presentation, it was that uh, there is other... Uh, other uh, guys that they are uh, uh, worried to bring some meaning to, to the shapes. And uh, for example, introduce the, uh, the nature. For example, some structural needs for, uh, for the, uh, or some, some natural meaning for the, for the shapes. And as he had to create uh, a shape that, uh, uh, Yes, in a certain way, they had, he had to uh, certainly to have to be aware of the natural conditions, structural conditions. If not, uh, the, the structure will will fall. Exactly. Yes. 
of course, it's not only nature, nature that uh, architecture had to deal with. Uh, it was to deal with humans and uh, their societies. Uh, and that uh, is the other materiality of uh, something exterior to architecture that uh, architecture must know. It must know everything. It's the Renaissance man, the architect. Well, there are, there are two, uh, two Renaissance men nowadays. It's the, the, the medical practitioner of uh, uh, well, uh, family medicine, and it is the architect. <laughs> the two guys that must know everything. <clears throat> um, well, I lost in uh, my, my reasoning, and I'm not thinking. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I think you have a coffee break there. <laughs>